All right. My name is Aaron Simpson. I am an operations specialist for Symphonic Distribution. I would like to welcome everyone who's here to the Hyped It webinar, where we talk about the amazing connection between Symphonic and Hyped It. Uh, just to give some background here, we implemented Hyped It a few months ago uh, for free pre-saves and free smart links. And uh, I can't say enough things about the company. It's a great company, um, great partnership. And uh, I'll give uh, the wheel over to John here and uh, let him tell you more about it. Aaron, thank you so much. And uh, thanks so much for the great, <laughs> great introduction and super excited about this, this partnership and uh, you know, helping music artists connect with more tools to reach and get more fans for their music. Uh, welcome everybody who joined this call today. Um, let me maybe get a quick sense of where you're dialing in from, guys. Give me give me a hi in the chat. Let me know where you're dialing in from today. Yeah, Logan, Florida. I mean, that's always makes everybody jealous. <laughs> Danny's here from Canada. Scott in Florida as well. You guys are lining up there. That's awesome. Um, and we had a few more folks on the line here. Um, oh, Maria's from Latvia. Sarah from Florida. Awesome um la scott there great um oh la in the year then florida in the winter <laughs> can't get better than that um nick is from lake district uk awesome so everybody's from um all over the place this is this is fantastic uh, literally global audience uh and bob's from right next to woodstock oh, i will say this summer that that's awesome um guys i'm also trying to get a sense for um how are you uh how are you distributing your music are you here as a as an independent music artist um so are you mainly distributing your own music or do you run a record label and do you use symphonic to distribute music for maybe yourself but also other artists trying to get a sense for that helps me to tailor my responses to you know how best to help you guys maybe let me know maybe type in artist if you're mainly using it as an artist type in label if you're using it as a label. So I see Bob says label, Scott artist, Nick artist, Danny label. So it seems to be like, uh, okay, so from those responses, 50, Maria runs the label as well. Oh, awesome. So we, we have a, a couple of label folks here. Fantastic. Okay, cool. And then what genre of music are you in? Just, just let me know the genre of music real quick. I'm an EDM, electronic. Awesome. I see techno, jazz and world music, dance music. Personally, I'm in the house music space as well. Maria EDM, new age ambient. Okay, awesome. So, um, so that's great. Okay, give, gives me a good sense of where you come from. Definitely leaning a little bit towards sort of electronic music here. Fantastic. Okay, cool. Look, this is this is going to be a Q and A format. Um, so I'm here to answer any questions that you guys have about anything related to uh, the symphonic integration with Hyped It. Um, and um, you know, maybe a good way to kick this off is uh, for me to ask you another question, which is. Um, what are the number one thing that you're struggling right, struggling with right now? So if you you have new releases coming out, you're setting them up uh, with your distributor with Symphonic, you're getting them out there, they appear on Spotify, Apple Music, Bport, wherever you have them. And then sort of what's the next step? What's the struggle that you're running into? Um, and maybe that's a good point where, you know, I can kick us off and uh, launch it into, into maybe strategies and tools and how Hyped It could integrate with all of this. And then we'll get into, um, get into maybe some software demos after that. So Nick says, uh, targeting playlists to build numbers. He's talking to the right guy about that. <laughs> Got it, okay. So that's one, let's, let's hear a few more if you guys are up for it. Nick, really appreciate that. That's good feedback. Scott says building fans. Love it.
Maybe let's see, let's see if we get one one or two more. Creating a proper release schedule and a good strategy to do so. Got it. Good stuff. Maria says, I just want to see what you are going to say about this feature. I haven't used it yet. Okay, awesome. All right. So um, yeah, let me let me touch on a few of those things. And then um, if you have any particular questions, specific questions, maybe you have tried to do a certain thing with hyped it, I just put it in there and I have you know my hyped it window open, ready to share my screen and walk you guys through it. But so all of these things that you just posted I, resonate really well with me because I've been sort of in a similar spot and, and definitely, uh, you know, have, have definitely had challenges with sort of the same things. And along the way of, of solving these, I've learned a few things that I'm always happy to share and, you know, help you guys, you know, advance your music career and, um, and help you reach your goal. So in my particular case, uh, just, you know, very brief background, uh, I've been making music since, I don't know, uh, you know, my my early childhood shoes um, been all over the place, you know, studied piano, drums, played in rock bands, and then eventually fell in love with electronic music and pursued that as a career. And I got lucky that uh, early on, I was signed by Warner, and um, I was producing music for all that compilations. So um, I put out, out of probably 100 tracks, so millions of copies of compilations. But then eventually, when my contract came up for renewal, they dropped me. And it was it was terrible because I built, you know, I built the, the dream of my future around making music professionally. And then I got dropped, which basically pulled the income from my music uh, away from under myself. And, um, um, you know, I, I was forced to, you know, go into a nine to five, you know, office job. And uh, it was it's really bad. But the reason why they dropped me, because I had this conversation with them, the reason why they dropped me was because they said, look, John, you know how to make music and we really appreciate all the music you made for the compilations, but nobody wants compilations anymore. That market has expired. That market's dead. We now want artists who have fans. If you have fans, there's something for us to build the business around. There's something for us to monetize. But if you don't have fans, um, there isn't that much we can do. And I didn't have any fans. I had all I had focused on was making good music and uh, you know honing my musical skills but i hadn't really realized that i'm not just in the business of making music i'm also in the business of making fans and we all are today right whether you're an individual music artist and you're trying to build your um your, your own music business for yourself and whether this is because you want to directly monetize it or you want to eventually offer it up to a label to help you further or if you already run a label right and you're monetizing your own music and the music of other artists it's all about that critical connection of building an audience and the fan base around you because that's at the end of the day where the business is so i had missed this and you know it took me years to rebuild uh, re rebuild this rebuild my music career and um and along the way came up this idea that eventually ended up launching hyped it which was this idea well what you know everybody else was promoting their music out there in the same way right everybody was just posting hey my new single is out you know click here to listen to it or hey my new album is out click here and listen to it and you know i tried the same stuff i tried promoting my music exactly the same way as everybody else did but without any meaningful results it was just slow growth and then eventually i thought to myself what what if i didn't promote my music just the same way everybody else did what what if i found a different angle what if i try to make an encounter with my music more valuable to a fan than what i see a lot of other people do what if i gave them access to something exclusive like a gift like you know maybe it's a download of a song or it could be something else as a reward for engaging with my music and at the time, you know, platforms like Hyped It and Gates and all that stuff didn't exist. So um, I, I looked around for software, there was none. And then I, I figured, OK, if this doesn't exist, maybe I should I should do something. I should build something. And this is this is when Hyped It was born um, as a way for music artists to share something of value, like a um, I call it rapid reward, something that that causes instant gratification in a fan when they discover your music in return for, you know, maybe pre-saving your music uh, that didn't exist at the time, but does now obviously following you, engaging with you, reposting your music and all of those things that add value 
um, to your track. So, uh, so this is how it's born. And then obviously it has grown over time. And I've really made it my mission along the way to help music artists reach and get more fans for their music. And I, I very much believe in the power and the concept of um, not doing what everybody else is doing, but standing out by figuring out ways to add your fans or, or give your fans more value than what everybody else does. Because if you do that, then you magnetically attract those audiences, they engage with you. And this works whether you want to build you know, followers on Spotify, followers on a playlist, whether you want to grow your email list, like whatever objection or whatever goal you have, um, sorry, not objection, objective, and whatever goal you have around um, lifting your music career, uh, can usually be tied to one of those strategies to just grow your audience and grow your fans. So anyway, so that's why this whole thing sort of resonates with me. And I already, you know, did a little dive into some of the strategies that I apply. Um, you know, I love, I love download gates um, or link gates for that matter, because, you know, not everybody needs a download, but, but the idea that if you can share an exclusive piece of content with a new fan that just discovers you and enters into your world, um, it can really make you know a, a big difference. Um, it's that that has become my number one strategy when it comes to um, pre-saves these days, right? Lots of folks do pre-saves, um, and the funny thing if if you compare pre-saves on a regular smart link to pre-saves on a gate, uh, and I've you know done this a couple of months ago where systematically tested this running facebook ads to um, the smart link with the pre-save and then the gate with the pre-save i got twice the number of conversions on the same um, budget to the same audience the exact same song like everything the same but just using a gate as opposed to pre-save so um lots of things possible here now you know i'm right now i'm sort of flying at a at a thirty thousand foot level as i'm dropping some of these things here <laughs> Um, why don't we um why don't we talk about the first question here uh targeting playlists to build numbers um why don't we talk about the best spotify practices um that people can do to utilize hyped it um absolutely so look my attitude towards spotify is is the following right spotify is an amazing platform and one of the best ways right now for music artists to get discovered and that primarily is because once you put fire to a song and the algorithm picks it up and spotify says okay now we're going to put pour gas on it right you can you can make some amazing numbers happen on spotify um amazing and i have numbers. to be grateful for you know hundreds of thousands of free streams and listeners that have just come from the algorithm and you know i I'm sure some of you on the call, you you know, you you probably do even bigger numbers, but um, you know, there's real power in the algorithm. So my focus, whenever I do something on Spotify, has always been, okay, what's the best way to trigger that algorithm, and not just accidentally, but in a in a way that is somewhat of a repeatable um, strategy. This is where my point of view on playlists might differ from you know a lot of viewpoints and 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 common belief that you get because i do not think that playlists are necessarily the best way um to repeatedly trigger the algorithm for your music and get it out there and the reason why is that if you look at how the algorithm on spotify works um the the um at the end of the day i mean it's it's a bit of a black box right nobody knows the exact formula other than the people obviously working at spotify but what we know uh, on the outside is that Spotify is looking for positive signals before it picks up music with the and then just you know uh, um, spreads it with the algorithm. So what are positive signals? Positive signals are positive engagement points that an audience has with your music on Spotify. So simply said, if somebody likes the song, right? They click like, they add it to their like songs playlist, that is a positive signal. If they listen to you the song, then they come over to your profile and they follow you, positive signal. If they um, if they listen to the song multiple times, they they just listen to it over and over, it's a, it's a positive signal to the algorithm. Um, so those are just a few examples. Now, where there are positive signals, they're also negative signals. Negative signals, are interactions that let Spotify believe that maybe your song wasn't the best match with a particular audience. And those are primarily if somebody skips your song. 
either they don't even make it to 30 seconds, uh, which is when Spotify counts a stream and a listener, or, um, or they skip soon thereafter. Now, if you get your music on a playlist, then if the playlist isn't a perfect match for, um, well, let's put it, two things could happen, right? Or, I mean, technically three things can happen, but mostly two will happen. And the one thing that you wanna have happening is the most unlikely to happen. So um, two things could happen. A, you have a playlist that has, you know, a lot of passive listening going on, which how most music listeners consume playlists, right? They hit play and then they let the music run, but they might do something else while the playlist runs. Maybe they're driving in a car, maybe they're working, maybe they're at the gym doing a workout. So the playlist is background music, but there's another primary activity that they engage with. In this case, your song comes up, it'll play right through, which is sort of a neutral signal to Spotify, right? They, it wasn't skipped. It also wasn't sort of liked or much engaged with because the person listening to the playlist was engaged in another activity. And this is when you see a ratio of listeners and streams that's, you know, almost one to one uh, rise. Yes, yeah, some fans will, you know, engage with the song, but the majority will passively stream through it. Um, and then the other scenario is somebody listens to the song, it's not what they came for on this playlist, they'll skip it. And this can happen if the playlist is a little bit broader in music genre, right? Um, let's say you have, uh, uh, you end up on an EDM playlist, but your music isn't necessarily, you know, main stage EDM, it, it falls into electronic music, but um, it's not the perfect match for the playlist, chances are you get some skips. So those are negative signals that would hold back some of the algorithmic distribution. What you would want to have happen is that everybody on the playlist is a, an active listener and is a diehard fan of your niche genre. So once they discover your track, they save it, they, they come over, they, they follow you, um, they play it on repeat. Now, oftentimes that is not what you get with playlists and particularly if it's bigger playlists. And um, again, I mean, I know we're not talking about hyped right now, but uh, it, I mean, I think all that stuff is important. So. Um, this is where sometimes the incentive of playlisters and music artists are not necessarily aligned, right? Because a playlister is all about growing the playlist as big as possible. And a way of growing a playlist as big as possible is to uh, include a broader audience in it, right? So playlisters not necessarily incentivized to dr uh, drill down into like a super niche genre that would be the perfect audience for your track, just because that would limit the playlist maybe to just a couple thousand people. But what they really want is they want a couple hundred thousand people on the playlist because they know it makes a lot of music artists more excited about being on there without actually benefiting them through a better match between audience and, and song. So um, where am I going with this? So my strategy for Spotify is not to use playlists as a traffic driver, but instead use other traffic drivers that allow me to put my music into a laser targeted audience, an audience that I control, first of all. Um, so I know they are diehard fans. I know it's not, it's not gonna be an audience that is diluted like on a big playlist. Um, and I also know it's something I can turn on and off anytime rather than submitting my music and then waiting and hoping for it to be approved and those kinds of things. So my strategy, for um, for Spotify is um, Facebook, Instagram ads. Love those, super effective. Uh, you can turn them off, on and off anytime. You can scale them no matter uh, you know where you want. You don't even need a big social follow. You can basically scale those to millions of um, of people reached. And um, but you can send that traffic directly to Spotify, right? So that's where smart links come into play. So the value of smart links in this kind of setup is that you can have your uh, your tracking information on that smart link, which is obviously something that hyped it does. Where you have your Facebook pixel on there, you have Facebook conversion API integrated. So now all the traffic that goes from Facebook through the smart link over into Spotify um, is tracked along the way. And that allows you to retarget them, build lookalike audiences, and, and mostly allow the algorithm in Facebook and Instagram to understand who are the people that engage with your music so that the algorithm can then go, or the AI can go and find more of these people for you. Um, again, I, you know, I know we're not here to talk about Facebook and Instagram ads specifically, but um, this is one of the 
uh, amazing use cases for the smart links is as a landing page between any sort of advertiser platform that you use to generate traffic and then going into Spotify and, and tracking the fan interactions um, throughout. And, and um, um, just to cut in here, uh, we especially see good results with the downloads as opposed to the other kind of gates you were saying, John? Say, say that one more time. You were saying that, that we get better results with the downloads on the gates for that kind of advertising than other ways that you can link the users? Uh, let, let me open something up real quick. I'll show you something uh, that I think is going to be interesting. And let me ask uh, in the chat here real quick, who of you guys is has run Facebook, Instagram ads before? Because um, if it's something you do, I know I know it's you know something that you're comfortable with. Okay, Aaron, perfect. Yeah, I actually built up multiple labels to over 20,000 playlist counts from running ads, as you're describing, uh, followers. So it works really well. Got it. Excellent. That's big. Yeah. Um, all right, let me share a screenshot here real quick. This is a screenshot um, from my Facebook ads account, which I took earlier this year. And this was this test that I spoke about when I had a new track coming out. The track was called Awakening. And I wanted to see what happens if I run a pre-save for this track as a regular smart link. You know how a smart link, when you set up for pre-release, it's sort of a pre-save. And then on release day, it automatically converts into a regular smart link. So that's what this is. And then the pre-save gate is just using a hyped download gate in this particular case, where I added a download of the actual track. So this wasn't even a new track uh, or a different track. This was the actual track that I offered uh, fans to download before the release date. And, and then in the gate steps, it did the same thing. A, a pre-save on Spotify, following the artists on Spotify. And I also had a playlist that I'm growing. So I, had, I added this in there as well. And now what you can see here, I'm going to highlight it this way. Maybe I'm not sure if you can see the annotation that I'm, I'm uh, uh, doing on this right now. But the top campaign here, this is running the ads to just to a smart link with a pre-save conversion. And you can see that um, we've got about 64 pre-saves here at a cost per result of 168. Now, don't worry about the absolute number here, but this number is highly specific on the quality of the song, the audience that you target, the geographies that you target, the time of year you're running these campaigns, those types of things. So it's not about the absolute number, but um, the relative performance between these campaigns is where it's at. So 168. Now, the same song, the same ads, the same pre-saves, plus the follows, plus the playlist follows, just using a gate instead of a smart link, was this campaign. All run at the same time. And you can see here, I got the results for 82 cents. So that's, that's, that's more than double the results for the same budget, right? And so here I got 171 conversions. The difference here is that if you offer a smart link with a pre-save to a fan, there's a lot of value to you as the artist, right? Because you get the pre-save, you know, on release date, your track is going to show up in the liked songs playlist of that fan. But there isn't a whole lot of value for the fan in a pre-save. Because for the fan, the pre-save is really just a calendar reminder. They could have literally also put a reminder in the calendar and said, hey, on release day, you know, come back and, you know, check out XYZ's um, song. But if you set it up with the download gate, now the fan gets an instant reward. They don't have to wait until like a week or two weeks later before they can do more with the song that you got excited, that you got them excited about right then and there they actually get a version of this that they can enjoy right away. And it doesn't have to be download. That can be anything, right? People do um, these kind of gay campaigns with anything that they believe adds value to their audience. So this could be access to an unreleased music video. This could be a, a, a PDF of a beautifully designed lyric sheet. You know, if, uh, or could be- um, You can also go to a secret link as well. Yeah, anything a secret link. That's what you do with a, um, with a, unreleased video, right? You wouldn't offer that as a download. You would just send them to a secret link. Um, 
And, but, but the fact that there's instant gratification built in, right? So, I mean, it's basic marketing strategies, but the, 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 the fact that there's an instant reward for a fan is such a high incentive that you get a lot more conversions. And, um, and this is when numbers play out like this. So actually, um, hold on, let me make this even more tangible by uh, switching over to another screen here so basically what i'm what i've shown you here in the in the, wow. the top line those are some numbers you know, i went to share music and i set up a pre-release marketing right this is the typical pre-save that you can't set up and on um, release day it automatically John, turns in so go ahead and scroll back up just let them see the uh numbers that have come through on your account um a little bit higher a little bit higher the over a million count um, so just to get an idea, John's getting crazy numbers from the way he's using hype to hear. Um, I mean, just, just over a million visits. That's, that's, it's amazing numbers. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Anyways, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, again, hyped it is a toolbox, right? Hyped it is not a one trick pony that does one thing. Hyped is, is a, is a, is a box of tools and, you can use those tools almost in a modular way and put them together to help you accomplish any goal around your music that you want to set. Again, whether that goal is to grow on Spotify or on Apple Music, whether you want to grow a playlist, whether you want to grow your profile, whether you want to, it's all about, you know, cracking the algorithm, whether you want to grow your email list to increase maybe merch sales through your email list. So, you know, any of those, um, you can basically support with the proper tools and the those tools in hyped it are under share music this is where you have all the tools that allow you to put your music out there and again share them with your fans so you have the gates you have smart links and you have pre-release smart links which is a pre-save and um, the pre-release smart links some... actually convert to smart links on the day of your release as well which is a really amazing feature so that's right. You, yeah. That, that, and that's why, you know, that's why I'm calling them pre-release smart links here. I know most folks uh, refer to them as pre-saves, but they so, are really smart links just prior to the release date. So what I like uh, to do, this will the, turn the smart into links on release date. is uh, I like to do the pre-save and then I go right back into the same pre-save. So the link is the same and I turn the pre-save on release day into the smart link. That way, the conversion for all of your fans is unchanged. And if they see any of the old posts, there won't be two separate links, and it's all fluid. So that's something really amazing that Hybrid offers here. So, yeah, yeah, Aaron, appreciate you highlighting this, and yeah, that's exactly how it works. And um, so, in reference to the results that I showed you from the Facebook ad campaign for pre-save specifically, in order to get that that result where I doubled the pre-saves, right? What I used in this case were the gates. So the gate is the one that rewards the fan for interaction. And Hyped has two kinds of gates. And what gate you pick depends on what the what the reward that you want to give that you want to share with fans, what that free giveaway, what that is. If that is something that is downloadable, such as an audio file, a PDF, um, you know, something of that nature, you would use a download gate because we have the technology built in to make that file available after somebody unlocks the gate and then the process would follow you, pre-save your music, follow a playlist. Again, you, you can set up what you want as, as a reward. Um, but if the reward is something that is not downloadable, downloadable, but for example, an unlisted YouTube video, right, to an unreleased uh, music video, for example, or um, uh, a link to, I don't know, a, a special discount on your merch store that isn't listed on the front end, but you have to have the specific secret URL in order to get there. Anything where you want to send somebody to a, a, a site on the web, rather than download something, you use the link gate. The, the result to you are the same, both of these gates support the same pre-saves, follows, reposts, likes, you know, all the same functionality across multiple different platforms, Spotify, Apple Music, SoundCloud, Instagram, and just goes on and on. Um, but they do different things at the end, download versus linking some, sending somebody to a secret link. Um, so 
I mean, I would say if you are running pre-safe campaigns right now for either your own music or for music that you release on your label, I would invite you to try on your next pre-safe to try one of those gates instead of a instead of just a standard uh, pre-safe smart link. Again, in my case, the result was that it doubled the number of pre-saves on the exact same budget and you know without changing anything. And the time to set up a gate is you know just the same amount of time it takes you to set up a pre-safe, which is you know I don't know sixty seconds or so. <laughs> Great. So, uh, I mean, just Thank to you, John. fly over this. Sorry. Um, so, so just a quick reminder here, every single Symphonic client has a free HypeKit account built right into their dashboard. So um, you go into releases, you'll see it there. Um, you get free smart links, you get free pre-saves. And uh, one more aspect of this is you can add playlist links to any gate as well. So it's a really good way to grow playlists. Mm -hmm. um, so another problem someone mentioned here earlier was um let's see here um i think someone asked about the best release strategy um creating a proper release schedule and a good strategy to do so um what would your advice be there um so most of the time when you talk strategy the question is what's the specific goal that you're after right if your goal is to sell physical um, physical music, right? Your release strategy will be substantially different compared to your goal being, hey, I want to maximize, um, uh, I want to, I want to maximize the pre-saves up front, or I want to use this release to get the most followers for my playlist. So the strategy can only, or, or, or is best if it's a response to a very specific goal. So um, I don't know who, uh, I saw this question, uh, if, if whoever asked this, um, if you wanna share a little bit more information on what your specific goal is, I can uh, maybe respond to it even better. What I'm doing right now, um, which is you know, a perspective I can share is uh, mostly when it comes to Spotify, the action happens once the song is out, right? There's just so much you can do ahead of time it really all starts when the song is out. Um, there, there is also sometimes a little misperception of how pre-saves really work, right? If fans pre-save your music, it doesn't actually, this is not data or information that Spotify gets. The information about pre-saves is all hosted on the platform that hosts the pre-save. So if a fan does a pre-save with Hypedit, it's with Hypedit. If you use another tool, it's with this other tool. The pre-saves work by fans giving Spotify and your pre-save tool, the permission to go into Spotify on the release day and use the API, like the backend language that the, the software tools use to communicate with each other to then save your music to their like songs playlist. So only on release day does Spotify receive any of the data and information about who actually pre-saved your song. So there isn't really, there isn't really, um, something you're not really warming up the algorithm by you know doing a ton of pre-saves prior to the um prior to the release all that data only hits on release day um and what that leads to is that you want to not do pre-saves too early on i think so i usually do pre-saves one to two weeks out, but not before that. And the reason A is that if fans have forgotten about the track by the time it comes out, um, that's not ideal. And also between the time period when somebody pre-saved your track to the release day, fans can go into Spotify, into their Spotify account settings and revoke any kind of third-party app permissions. So you may have noticed that the first time you do pre-save, um, you have to, you get a little Spotify pop-up window that says, hey, you know, um, Spotify wants you to agree or wants you to know that you're agreeing to, you know, this, this backend access into your Spotify account to, to do pre-saves in the future, blah, blah, blah. And this permission is something that fans can revoke. So if you did a pre-save campaign like four weeks out and fans log into Spotify between that time that they pre-saved and your release day, and they, they change their permissions. Maybe they even close their Spotify account, right? You, you're losing those pre-saves. So that's why I keep that a little bit more compressed. 
And then from release day on, it's, it's about getting uh, results fast as quickly as you can. There's something called the popularity score on Spotify. It's a data point that you can monitor. And usually there's a pattern that once the popularity score hits between 20 and 30, you get picked up by the algorithm. And um, the popularity score has something to do with the amount of traffic and positive signals that you're getting over a you know, specific period of time. So the more interaction and engagement you're getting on your song over a shorter period of time, the higher your popularity score. Um, so that's why setting everything up prior to release date and maybe running a pre-save you know, one or two weeks out can be um, a good way to get some initial data points into Spotify. And then having your campaign ready to go from release day on um, to give this give this track sort of an instant push. That's usually the, the the strategy to success. If if your goal is, for example, to you know get the music recognized on Spotify and get the algorithm to kick in. Um, Aaron, how does this answer the question? Yeah, um, just out of curiosity, so if you're doing this strategy, how often would you personally release music? Is there a best practice there? Is there anything to avoid? Is less is more kind of thing? Uh, just curious your thoughts. Yeah, so um, I've experimented with this a little bit um, for myself. And usually it's sort of, you want to release music as oftentimes as you can without sacrificing quality. Um, I figured for me as an artist that that ended up being sort of, you know, once a month. Um, and uh, I tried to accelerate that schedule a little bit because, you know, there's there's this theory, obviously, that the more often you release, the more release radar do you get. And um, there's some of this happening, but uh, I, you know, I, once a month was, was pretty solid Two a month didn't necessarily give me double the results in terms of release radar pickup. Interesting. And then obviously if you do less, then, uh, it allows your music to age a little bit more, which, you know, listeners might eventually tune out without you having sort of new material out. Um, now as a record label, obviously that might not even be concerned because you may have, you know, so much music to put out, um, that there's, you know, constantly new things coming. Um, and if you have a playlist as a label where you add all your, your releases, you know, that might be something that can be really hot because there's, uh, new music on it frequently. But, um, I would, I would go with once a month at the minimum and more frequently, if you can maintain quality. That'd be my perspective on this right now. That's great. Um, I think once a month is definitely a really good sweet spot. Also, if you're really trying to pitch and target editorials, I've seen as well, it seems like the once a month uh, has more frequency of getting placed than doing like a single a week kind of thing. Um, so we actually have Dever here in our chat who wants us to expand a little bit more about creating awareness for a specific artist. Do you have any best practices there or um, does this just kind of follow along um, everything that you've already said here? What are your, what are your thoughts there? Awareness for a specific artist. Um, yeah, like let's say that you want to grow more of an artist as opposed to their releases, I think they mean. You know what I mean? Um, I'm not a husband, sure. Like we're talking about just, um, getting a getting an artist with a particular song or with uh, with a with multiple songs just more exposure on any well, particular um, platform or i think i'll kind of chime in here you know hyped it has so many tools that you could build your artist name i mean almost an infinite number of ways um, one way that comes to mind is right now i'm doing a lot of of contests with label radar remix contest and for every contest we put up a gate uh, where you have to follow us on Spotify and the artists to download the stems. Um, so that's a really good way to build artist numbers. So along that thinking, you can pretty much set up any campaign that you can think or dream of. Um, it's it's wide open. So. Hey, hey, John, Denver here. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Can I hear you. Hi, Denver. Uh, awesome. Um, yeah, so just to be a little bit more specific. So let's say, you know, you have an, an artist that has uh let's say 26 records to release in 2020 what would be the best strategy um 
what would be the best strategy to do that? And then what would you consider to be a conversion, right? Because when you're setting up a gate or a funnel or anything to market any product or specifically music, you know, you have to create awareness first, but what are some parameters that you would consider to be conversion? That's my question. Got okay. So the, the, the conversion strategy? is something that that's technical. So I can answer that. That's very easy. Now, so you have 26 records for this artist that you want to release over the year. What what we call success at the end of the year? Is it is it if if you have you know x many followers uh, for this artist? Is it if you have an x size email list? Touring. Is it if you've if you've gotten a million streams? Is it if you've sold a hundred? uh you know uh, 100,000 copies of the album or you know give me a sense of what what you would well, call those, success at the end of the year sure sure well those are all targets to the goal you know the overall goal is performing shows and and uh and, and touring live right but those are all targets if you will but the, the the main question is like what type of strategy would you start to create that conversion when it comes to your music more specifically I feel like that would be a better way to apply the question yeah, so so there's conversion in the technical sense is you know something that's built into all the tools in hyped it, the gates, the links, the pre-saves. And um, it is defined in Facebook. So whenever somebody downloads um, a gate, when somebody um, unlocks a link gate, when somebody clicks on a pre-save, if somebody pre-saves, um, from a from a pre-save, then hyped it sends an event over to Facebook, which is called a you know conversion event, and that will show up in your Facebook ads manager in the events manager. It'll say, hey, you just got a hyped it download, you got a hyped it smart link unlock, you got a hyped it smart link uh, click, you got a hyped it pre-save. So those events will all show up there, and the way to make them show up is by you know just having your pixel and your conversion api access token in here which are both things that you would save under your hyped account settings and then whenever you set up any kind of tool here then you can uh, you know can easily bring this in with like a click of a button and now whenever fans engage with that particular page it sends it over into facebook and that allows you to run these conversion optimized campaigns Denver, am I understanding correctly what you're asking about conversions here? Uh, I, okay, let, I, I know what you mean with when it comes to these conversions. So like, let me be more specific. So like okay. a, little bit, a little bit ago, there was like, um, you had showed a million streams up there, right? So like, what strategy would you use, right? For those million streams, out of, out of those million streams, how many people actually converted? When I say converted, I mean, whether followed you on Spotify, Instagram, Facebook, how did they interact with the content after the music? And and if and after that, what was the strategy that you used? Because getting them to listen to the music is one thing. That's not a fan. That's just someone that's listening to music. Now, what is the strategy that you're using to convert them to an actual fan? Got it. Okay. Okay. So totally got it now. Awesome. So the the secret to success might sound really, really simple. It goes back to what we talked about earlier. So um playlist promotion versus other traffic generators the best way to convert a listener into a fan somebody who not just just listens to the music and then leaves and you never see them or hear from them again but they they connect with you in a way that you can now call them part of your fan base they'll come back to listen to your music they followed you and they're taking other action they might be following you on a different platform um the the key to success to make that happening is to put your music in front of an audience that is that is already in love with your particular sound of music right let me let me throw out like a stupid example let's say i'm let's say i'm a techno musician and i want to promote a techno track and i'll put this techno track into in front of an audience that loves classical music right yes i can have you know a million people click a play button but chances is they they you know they hit skip a couple seconds in because it's not their cup of tea and then they move on so then you say well okay let me find the techno playlist and i'll put it in front of the techno playlist and um you know now you get more listeners but you know techno is still pretty wide of a genre and there are you know there are different kinds of techno music in there and the the one that you're making is probably a particular 
um, subgenre or very specific sound within the overall techno um, techno genre. So how do you drill down? How do you get your music in front of fans who love that specific sound, not just the umbrella genre, but that specific sound? Because those are the people that if they already love the sound and they discover your song, all they have to do is, you know, step a little bit to the side and, you know, and, and start following you. Um, because they they already love what you're doing. They didn't know you yet, but they already love what you're making. So it's so easy for them to become, uh, you know, raving fans really, really easily. So the lens through which I evaluate promo strategies is usually, okay, what traffic source can I utilize that gets my music in front of this super laser targeted audience that I know is already in love with my specific sound and style of music because if you if you get that done then all the other things fall into place um so you, you i mean you might be wondering i show you how to click a specific button or you know flip a switch in facebook or you know like a technical um tactic or or hack but there isn't really it all comes down to how well can you put your music in front of that audience and if you do that then you'll see those numbers um, multiple. I sh I'll show you this here real quick. Um, this is one of my this is one of my own playlists here. Um, I created this, right? Spotify did not actually create it. This is John Gold playlist for me um, yet. I don't think I have enough songs out on Spotify. So I I I modeled this. I created a playlist. It's not this. It doesn't look like the same, but it's obviously called This Is John Gold. And I'm using this as a destination for my ads as one of the destination from my ads and what you see what's really interesting is that you know i got what about 1800 listeners here but about 20 21 000 streams which tells you that every listener streams more than 10 songs on average on that playlist and this is how you can monitor how well you've dialed in the targeting for your um, for your traffic sources, right? You can get you can get a hundred thousand listeners to come over if they are the wrong listeners. You're gonna see, you know, a hundred thousand listeners and maybe just a little over a hundred thousand streams. Um, but what you want to see is a pattern like this, where a listener turns into you know multiple and multiples of that number in streams, if that makes sense. Um, and the way I do this, again, coming back to to hype it um, with smart links is, hold on, let me, let me jump back to here. So I, I do like running Facebook, Instagram ads, as I said, because that for me has turned out to be an excellent way to get in front of a laser targeted audience. Google ads using YouTube and video placements is another great way to do this, right? Also allows you to put your music in front of that laser targeted audience. Um, and then, you know, just run these, run these smart links. Um, and um, one thing that I like to do is I'll, you know, I'll just show you some of the settings here. Um, if it's specifically Spotify, I like to only include Spotify on the smart link. So you see a lot of artists use smart links that have Spotify, Apple Music, um, you know, Deezer, and you know, what have you, like 20 links stacked on top of each other. And I know this is one use case for SmartLink. It's a use case where you, you put your music in front of an audience and you are indifferent to where they end up and where they engage. But if I say I want to specifically grow on Spotify, and the reason why I want to specifically grow on Spotify is I want to get some of this action here, right? I mean, Discover Weekly is, you know, is is low. I haven't released new music in a while, but radio is really where it's at, right? Again, 4,400 listeners and then you know, 17, 18,000 streams. So again, you have this effect of uh, getting way more streams than you have listeners. To have this happening, you need a lot of traffic into Spotify. And um, so the way to make this happen is on your smartening, only give fans one option. Don't give them like 20 options where they then spread out into 20 different directions, give them one option. So that way you, you channel all that traffic and, and all that excitement into one platform. And that's easiest to then uh, you know, crack that nut, crack that platform first. So for your artist, I would probably decide on a platform. I'd say, hey, where do we want to um, blow him or her up? On Spotify, on Apple Music, on SoundCloud? YouTube doesn't matter. Just pick one rather than say, um, you know, uh, I, anything goes. So I'd pick one platform. I'd set up smart links for those tracks, only go into that platform, 
I would utilize um, ads, right? Always have my tracking stuff in here. Um, I always turn off the audio previews on my smart links because I don't want fans to get distracted if I use ads, right? The rationale is somebody already listened to the song on the ad. They don't need to listen to it again on the smart link. It's just a distraction. So I turn on, I turn off the audio preview on those smart links. Um, and, uh, and that's it. And then um, once I have them in my world, I can retarget them with other things, right? So now, for example, I can use a, I, I can use a download gate uh, and put that in front of them. And what I love for download gates is to have the email capture step included because I'm, I'm a big supporter of the value of an email address. And then once you have the email address, then, um, then you've already won the game because now what you can do is you can engage them with other gates rotating through platforms. So for example, I know I have them all in Spotify and now I got some email addresses. Maybe next I want to bring them all over to Apple Music or I want to bring them over to YouTube or I want to bring them over to any of these other platforms. So what I do is I would send uh, an email out for a new song to my email list. But of course the gate that I'm sending to my email list, I wouldn't use email capture because I already have that email address. I would say, you know, maybe pre-release, you can get a free download of the song if you, you know, if you um, follow, if, if you subscribe on YouTube or if you, um, if you, you know, follow me on Apple Music, something along those lines. So now with every gate, you can rotate through the platforms. And this is how you take this initial audience. I know you're connecting them to all these other, all these other places. So let me, let me pause here, Denver, to see. You got it, my man. To that's see if this helps. That's the strategy I'm talking about. <laughs> and, you know, these strategies, they're infinite. Whatever you can think of, you can apply a gate to. Um, that's that's the problem, though. You know, yeah. what I mean? like there's too, like, you know, to be quite honest, humans just have too much, uh, too many options sometimes. So I'm you yeah. know, trying to see and ask what works for him, um, because what works for him may not work for me. But some strategies and step, look, some steps or targets within that may be able to be applied to our overall goal, if that makes sense. For sure. Yeah, I'd also say this, Denver. Um, the, the question I recommend you ask yourself is, what would I call success at the end of the, the day, right? Nail, nail down a very specific, tangible goal. Um, and then if you ever need help with how to make something like this happen or how you know, we would approach it from you know, our experience on Hyped It, and obviously you know, there's, there's a gigantic global community of artists that's using this tool and we have a lot of insights there, always feel free to reach out. Now, access to me is not limited to this, um, to this call. You guys can always, you know, if you're in Hyped, you can always click on this little question mark here, leave a message, or you can send an email to hello at hypedit.com and always get help that way. I can't promise that I'm going to be the one answering to, you know, any particular email, but um, everyone on our, on our team is a music artist. Uh, literally everybody, anybody you hear back from is going to be a music artist using these tools, using these strategies. So, um, and it obviously it doesn't cost you anything uh, other than sending an email. If you ever want to just, you know, get a few sound bites or get a few additional ideas, that's, that's always um, a way to reach out. Cheers, man. Thank you. All right, well, I think we have time for one more question, maybe two. Does anyone have anything else they want to ask while we're here? I see Scott saying here, how long on average do you run your campaigns to drive traffic to, say, Spotify? Um, Scott, I, I don't give myself a time frame. Um, I'm, I'm using more of an evergreen sort of approach, which is to say, look, I have, you know, 10, 20, 30 songs on Spotify, not all of these tracks are equally good tracks. Some of my tracks are bigger songs or, or more popular songs and others aren't. So if you look at my profile here, my back to me clearly is performing better than Sunshine is. So as long as I'm getting good results from a campaign for back to me, even though Sunshine might be a newer track, I'm gonna run my campaign for back to me because my approach here is that any new fan, or let's put it this way, if a, if, a, if a new fan hears one of my songs for the very first time, it doesn't matter how old the song is. The song could be years old. It is a brand new song to them because they are listening to it 
for the very first time and it got them excited and it got them to engage with my music. So the, my goal is to always put my best foot forward. My best foot are the best songs. And this is what I recommend you know, everybody do. Um, if you have multiple songs out and you have a sense for which of these songs have performed better than others, I would try to um, make those higher performing songs or better performing songs, songs your, your, your leads when it comes to promoting your music. And there isn't really a natural expiration date on it unless you've eventually exhausted the audience and say, well, everybody in my audience now has listened to the track. But then you'd see that in your numbers. If you'd run Facebook, Instagram ads, you would eventually see the cost per conversion just go up, up, up. And then you would move on to the next song. But I would milk a hit song for as long as you can and prioritize that over saying, okay, I always have to promote my latest song above all else. I don't think that that's true. I think you get the best overall result and the best overall growth if you always promote your biggest hits the most. All right. Well, I think that uh, concludes our hyped it webinar. Um, personally, I can't say enough positive about the platform. Um, I integrate it in literally every single action I do from pre-release to the actual release to post-release to non-releases to uh, YouTube downloads for my descriptions to remix contests. Like I have these gates everywhere. So um, as a reminder, these gates are totally free at the basic level, just the basic level. Um, if you're a Symphonic customer, right in the dashboard, you just click on the hyped it link under any release. You'll see the button there. And uh, thank you, John. I appreciate your time. And, yeah, you're welcome. And thank you oh, so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. All right. Yeah. All right. Have a good one.